Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Hawaii Association for College Admission Counseling Virtual College Fair. Thank you for joining us for this session, with the, which is Pathway to College for Students with Disabilities. Uh, just a few housekeeping announcements before we get started. You can use the Q&A button on your screen to type your questions to our presenters at any time. Your cameras and microphones are off, so the panelists can't see or hear you. This is just one of many different sessions happening. Be sure to sign up for additional ones where you sign up for this one. And this presentation is being recorded. It'll be available within about a week at strivescan.com slash Hawaii. That's all the housekeeping stuff. I've gotten that out of the way. So I will step out of the way and turn it over to our presenters now. Once again, thank you for joining us today. All right, good morning or good afternoon, wherever it is you're tuning in from. Um, I'm very excited that we have this presentation today because um, we would really like to get more awareness out there about um, accessibility for all students with any type of disability, uh, health condition, be it learning disability or otherwise. And these are our wonderful presenters. Um, my name is, I'm gonna introduce myself and then I'm gonna introduce the panelists that I in, invited to join us here in Hawaii EACAC because um, I got to meet some of these people through NACAC and I wanted them to share their wealth of knowledge. I work at Asset School. You might have heard of us. We are a small private school that serves students with learning um, differences or giftedness or both. And I have served many students with a variety of disabilities over the years. Um, we are not exactly a traditional college prep school, but the great majority of our students do go on to college um, as they make their post-secondary plans. Go ahead, Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Entlick. I am a clinical psychologist and independent educational consultant serving students worldwide. Um, and uh, like Ferris, I work with students with learning differences, some gifted, some not, um, autism, ADHD, dyslexia, other learning differences, and other kinds of challenges, emotional challenges. Um, and I'll turn over to Annie. Thanks, Eric. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Annie Tolkien. I am the founder and director of Accessible College. Um, at Accessible College, we provide college transition support and preparation for students with physical disabilities. So that might be someone who uses a wheelchair or has an, another type of mobility impairment. And we also work with students with health conditions and health conditions is kind of broad. So it could be someone who has diabetes or Crohn's disease or lupus or cancer or another type of chronic health condition and also students with mental health conditions as well. Um, and we do that because colleges and universities provide varying levels of support for students with disabilities and health conditions. Um, and so the services that I provide kind of help to bridge those gaps. And I think we'll probably dive a little bit deeper into that as we go throughout the presentation. So I'll hand it over to Lillian. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lillian Dotran. I am the region recruiter from the University of Arizona based in Seattle, Washington. Um, and then I'll talk more about the SALT Center, which is one of our resources at the University of Arizona, as well as the Disability Resource Center, um, where we help students with learning challenges and learning differences. All right, this is just a general outline of what we're gonna do. We're, I might sound like I'm talking fast and that's because I want this to be interactive. I see we have a nice small group today. So please pop questions into the Q&A um, anytime and we will try to answer all your questions during the live presentation today. Um, and if not, we can get back to you later. We do have some top tips from the panelists um, and uh, the SALT program is the example of our very supportive program um, that we wanna feature today. All right, next. Um, I just wanna go over some basics. Um, you might already know this, but in K-12 ed education, there's a law called the Individual Disabilities Education Act that protects students. And that puts the onus on schools and families to identify the needs of students um, who need support in order to make their educational goals. And that the focus of that is really success. When you get to college, the word is really access um, because the laws that protect you in college, IDEA disappears. Uh, when you graduate from high school and it's the American with Disabilities Act and Section 504, the Rehabilitation Act, um, they remain. And plus there's FERPA, which applies to everyone, which means that 
students are in charge of their records and you might not even be able to access or help them and certainly cannot advocate for them. Um, I did put a link there and we are going to share a PDF of the slideshow with all the live links. So um, just so you know, you'll get the slides, but the UH COCOA program just has their rights and responsibilities. COCOA is their disability support office at UH Manoa. Every college has a disability support office in the United States. Um, other countries might frame the laws differently. Um, there are some other countries that have good supports, but um, you have to, we're, we're focusing on the US laws in this uh, slide and in this presentation. Um, the biggest thing, and I, I have the fish jumping into the big bowl because I always say, my, my parents often say, is my student ready? And, and it's always like, yes and no, because my students tend to be very well lopsided ready in some ways and, and not ready in others, but they do have to take that leap because they own their own records. They are the ones that have to self-identify and ask for what they need. So they must know themselves. Um, and I always advise parents early on in high school to kind of switch their mode of no longer being in charge of their student, but becoming a consultant, not their CEO, which Rick Lavoie, a learning difference expert shared um, in one of his books. And I just love that quote. Um, and Dr. Kathy Ferguson from UH Manoa, she's also a local expert in dyslexia and a former assets parent. She says, give them a hand up, not a handout. Let them own the process because if they own the whole process, they're going to be much better prepared as well to transition to college. Um, and I have a picture of a bridge there because they all have gaps. All students, whether they have a disability or not, have gaps when they go to college in their college readiness. And I think we really need to change the conversation from, oh, everyone has to be perfectly prepared to, at that point, it's how do we bridge those gaps? And that is actually, again, not my idea. I got that from um, Dr. Susan Travis, who studied our own uh, graduates at Asset School and identified several bridges that you can think of. And, and the, one of the main bridges is access to ongoing supports and accommodations. You can go to the next slide. Um, and in searching for colleges, um, I also like to remind people, because I wear glasses, we would never tell someone who needs glasses that they just need to try harder um, in order to see things. Same thing with accommodations. We need to have them work smarter, not harder, but it's a very personal fit. Um, I do think college fit is important for any student, but for a student with disability, it's just a more complex question and you have to look more closely um, and I have a picture of Curry College there, which is a particularly supportive college. They have a fee-based support program. Getting on the campuses, visiting is so valuable, very hard right now. So, you know, making use of these virtual formats is a very good thing, but also really exploring what are the, the supports on, on the various campuses you're exploring in a little more depth during the college search process is important and have the student involved in that. Um, and really consider what are the deal breakers for your student um, in terms of what's gonna make them not graduate from that program. So for example, you know, if, the, if math is a real challenge, you have to look at how math is handled in the curriculum at that university or second language. And I think executive function is one of our most common barriers for students. Um, and unfortunately the executive function demands on students increase dramatically when they go to college compared to high school. They are in charge of their own time and materials so much more. So that's just some considerations when you're searching for college um, and university options for a student with disability. I'm going to turn it over now to my friend Eric who's going to share some other tips. Thanks, Ferris. And I just wanted to reiterate what Ferris said earlier. Please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A at any point. Um, we will try to fly through this so we have some time to answer your questions. So put your questions in at any point and we'll get to them when we get through the materials. Uh, by the way, Curry is doing on person uh, in-person visits, but it's in Massachusetts, so I'm guessing not too many of you folks are, are going to uh, do a visit soon. Uh, but a lot of these colleges are doing very limited visits, like three students, three families at a time. Used to be you could go to a college and see like 50 students in the waiting room, but uh, not these days. So uh, assess college readiness, uh, Ferris mentioned that, um, really important. Um, that's what I, when I work with families, um, that's the first thing I focus on is trying to figure out uh, what areas the student needs to work on to be able to thrive in college. And if we address it early enough in high school, they can work on those things while they're in high school. And college readiness isn't just about can you handle college level academics, can you handle the, the coursework in college. Um, if you're doing well in high school, if you're taking challenging courses, you probably will be okay in that department. 
but but is your child getting themselves up in the, in the morning by themselves? Are they keeping track of homework by themselves? Are they able to make appointments with a counselor or a tutor by themselves? There's all these things that need to be handled independently in college. Um, and if, if the student isn't really on track, then you can either work on those things in college, take a gap year and work on them in a college readiness program, or go to a college that's particularly supportive and um, get supports to do that in, in college. Um, so sometimes families or students will ask, you know, should I disclose my diagnosis during the application process? Say, if I'm on the spectrum, should I talk about that when I'm applying to college? Is that going to help me? Is that going to hurt me? Um, it's really a, a, a individual question for each person to handle individually. Um, I have had students talk about their challenges in their essays because it was an important part of their identity and they, they, that was important to them to do so. Um, but if that's not the case, really, it's more a question of whether there's something that needs to be explained on the application. Like I had a student who changed high schools in the middle of high school to get more support for his learning difference. Another student who went on medication during high school and his grades went up as a result. So if there's something interesting going on in that transcript that, that the diagnosis would help explain, then that might be useful. But you don't need to put it out there just for the sake of doing so. That is different from, from disclosing it to disability services. I was talking about, do you disclose it to the admissions folks? Uh, I highly recommend that families start looking into services, supports, accommodations available in college. Um, when you're looking at colleges, not after you've made a decision and you've put down that deposit and then say, okay, let's see what they have to offer for my child. That's way too late because you might find out they, they're, they're understaffed or they, don't, they can't meet your needs. So, when you're looking at colleges, when you're going, whether it's virtual visits in person, make a separate appointment with the disabilities office. Sometimes if there's a, a separate support program like the SALT program in Arizona, that is often a separate from the disability services. So um, you, you want to look at those as well. Um, and keep in mind that accommodations and supports and services are not the same thing. All colleges will provide accommodations under the ADA that Ferris mentioned earlier. So if you need extra time on tests or a separate room or to sit in the front row or to be able to bring your laptop to class, whatever that accommodation is, that's a standard thing that in theory you should be able to get at any college. But additional supports like an executive function coach to meet with you every week to help you stay on track with your assignments, that is not something that's standard in college, but it is something available in certain programs like Arizona. Um, also find out what accommodate, what uh, documentation you're gonna need. Frequently, it's a neuropsychological evaluation. We're talking for students with learning differences, not other kinds of disabilities. Uh, frequently, it's a neuropsych evaluation that's been done within three years of starting college. That's, I say frequently, that is not always the case. It varies from college to college, that's why I advise families to, to reach out to the colleges, do your research, find out um, what am I going to need at this college? Do I need to get a new updated testing? Um, most likely, if you're on an IEP or 504, that document is not going to be particularly relevant or sufficient for your needs. Um, and get those accommodations lined up, meet with the staff before classes start, because once classes start, you could fall behind very quickly. So get everything lined up before they before it's, you start. And um, finally, you know, if if there are still gaps in readiness, think about taking a gap year, um, another year of brain development, another year to work on social skills, independent living skills can be really helpful. So I could spend a whole hour talking about this stuff, but I'm going to pass it on. I think Annie is next. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, so again, I'm Annie Tolkien. Um, and through my company, Accessible College, I focus mostly on working with students with physical disabilities and health conditions. Um, and there are some similarities in what Eric shared. Many of the same things um, come up for students who have physical disabilities or health conditions. You still have to provide documentation to the disability support office. You still have to go into the disability support office and be able to talk about what your needs are. Um, and if you need more supports, you still have to be asking questions. So all of those things are the same. Um, and Ferris and Eric both mentioned the Disability Support Office. And I wanna make sure 
that folks kind of understand what that is, because it might be called something else. It might be called accessibility services or student support services or disabled student services. Um, so one way to figure out when you're looking at schools, like where is that office? Just go to that school's website and in the search box, put in disability support. And typically that will bring up and take you to the disability support office website. Um, I also wanted to share that in my previous position, I was the associate director of the disability support office at Georgetown University. Um, and so I kind of bring that lens to, to my work and thinking about how we're meeting students' needs. Um, and also that kind of helps me know how universities think about things because um, I've been on the other side of that desk. Um, so here are my top five tips for students with physical disabilities and health conditions, which quite frankly also apply to students with learning, learning disabilities and, and neurodiverse students and basically any, any student. Um, so you need to be able to talk about your disability because when you apply for accommodations, you actually have to submit your documentation. Usually then the disability support office will connect with you and either have a phone call, a Zoom call, an in-person meeting to talk about your accommodations. So they'll actually review your documentation and then they'll ask you questions, you know, like, oh, why do you need this extra time? Or what are the things that you need? Um, for students with health conditions and physical disabilities, those needs might be a little bit different beyond the typical things like time and a half, um, you know, the preferential seating, like seating in the front of the class, like Eric was talking about. You might need other stuff. If you have a health condition that has a flare up that's not predictable, you might need flexibility in attendance, or you might need um, a note taker in class because you have some brain fog because of medication. So there might be some other things. So you need to be able to talk about your disability. You also need to know what your needs are. And this one is key because um, outside of academics, specifically for students with physical disabilities and health conditions, if you're living on campus, there are accommodations that you can get for living on campus, so in the dormitory. So you might need an accessible dorm room or you might need to have a single room because um, you need a place that's quiet to rest and recover because you have a migraine disorder or you have an injectable medication. Let's say that you have diabetes and you do your insulin shots or you have another type of um, condition that requires you to take a certain medication that maybe you need to administer privately. Um, and so you might wanna have a single room or you might need to have a room with a private bathroom. A lot of students who have gastrointestinal issues, Crohn's disease, colitis, things like that, maybe need a little bit more privacy and um, don't wanna to have to share that all with their roommates. So you need to be thinking not just about the academic supports that you need, but also about you know, recreational supports, residential supports, dining supports. If you need um, an accommodation for the dining hall, let's say that you have celiac disease and you need you know, to make sure that you can, the school can provide a gluten-free diet or you have a special diet because of a health condition that you have. Um, or if you have a physical disability and you just need help, like getting food from the dining hall, there, these are all things that you have to think through. So I always tell students, literally think through your day from the beginning of the day to the end of the day and start making lists of what are all, what are all the areas where you're getting a support, right? Who's helping you with those things? Um, connecting with the disability support offices, this was the same as what Eric just said. Um, to talk to those schools that you're interested in and asking specific questions. You know, I always use scenarios when I'm, when I'm working with students to, to ask questions to the disability support offices. We all noted that most, you know, every university is going to say that they're ADA compliant. That's, that's you're gonna hear that from everybody. Oh yeah, we're ADA compliant. But what that means and what that looks like is a little bit different at every place. So you need to be sure that you're asking questions that aren't just yes, no questions that actually get you real responses. And sometimes giving them a scenario can help um, where you kind of paint a picture and you say, if you had a student who has XYZ thing and they wanted XYZ accommodation, how would you respond to that? <laughs> that can be really helpful. So that's kind of a pro tip. Um, and then consider continuity of care in your planning. So a lot of times students need, um, you know, other supports like a therapist, like if you have a mental health therapist that you see, 
or if you have another type of doctor that you see, an occupational therapist, a physical therapist, starting to think about how am I going to transfer that care when I go away to college? Likewise with medication, um, you know, if your student isn't able yet to fill their own prescriptions or make their own doctor's appointments, starting to work on those skills early so that you'll have an easier time when the student goes away. Um, and the fifth thing, and it's also something that Eric shared, start early, as early as you can. In my, with my company, I start working with students as early as ninth grade. Um, so there's, I mean, there's no, you, you need to just start as early as you can. Start chipping away and identifying those skill sets that students need to be able to have in place so that they can live independently. So I am gonna hand it over now to Lillian. So now I'm going to talk about the SALT Center at the University of Arizona, as well as other resources that we have, um, like the B Disability Resource Center. Um, so first about the SALT Center, um, the SALT Center inspires students with mild to moderate learning attention, learning and attention challenges um, to succeed at our school. So we provide a lot of different resources um, and tools for our students. So on the next slide, um, I have kind of a list of things that we offer. So we offer tutoring. Um, so we offer one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions, group tutoring sessions, test preparation for before exams. So we can review the information in notes as well as reading and writing lab and math and science lab. Students can also work with a student support specialist in an individualized learning plan. So their students can kind of um, go over, you know, how can they take notes better in school or what really works for them when they're studying to retain that information. We um, provide individualized assistance with educational planning, goal setting, time management, um, and as well as learning strategies. And we offer peer tutoring and other workshops. And these workshops kind of ranges. So we have exam preparation, um, test taking workshops, note taking workshops, reading strategies, writing workshops, as well as procrastination to help students um, navigate that in college, as well as textbook navigation. We also offer um, psychological services that are available for students through the SALT Center as well at the University of Arizona um, and other tools. So we also have like note-taking devices if students need that. Um, we have technology to make um, textbook font larger for students if they need that. So we also have innovative technology and text to audio. So a lot of great tools for our students from the SALT Center. There is a separate application process for the SALT Center, which does include um, a fee for students to be part of the SALT program. But we also have the Disability Resource Center, which are free, is free for students. Um, and at the Disability Resource Center, we have a Disability Cultural Center for students to really find a community away from home and to get involved on campus, as well as we incorporate universal design into the classroom uh, to make it accessible for all, as well as assistive technology. Um, and the Disability Resource Center also offers free tutoring, free test preparation and workshops that's different from the SALT Center. And we also have adaptive fitness center through the Disability Resource Center. So those are some of the things that we offer um, as far as resources. Um, just to mention the SALT Center, students from all grade levels can apply. So it could be the first year students, freshman year, sophomore year, but it's heavily um, with freshman students kind of their transition into college. Uh, we get some sophomore students coming back for the SALT Center, and then students just have to reapply each year if that is something that they in, want to stay involved with. Um, and then right now, the SALT Center do have virtual tours so you can see the facility virtually. Lillian, I don't know if this is a good time for it, but there was a question in the Q&A. Um, so maybe go back to the SALT Center. Does the SALT program individual, SALT, excuse me, SALT programs individual learning plan get shared with instructors as part of requesting accommodations for particular classes? 
Do you need me to reread it or can you see it? No, I can see it now. Um, okay, good. So the SALT Center, um, if you're a part of the SALT program, your professors or instructors are not notified that you're part of the SALT program. Um, but if you are getting accommodations, so they will also work with Disley Resource Center to work with the professors for accommodations. So at that point, if you are getting accommodations, you'll actually have to work with Disability Resource Center. Um, and that way, if you need extra um, test time or you have to do that in our testing center rather than in class, things like that. Um, so if you do need accommodations, students will have to work with Disability Resource Center. Sometimes students work with the SALT Center and Disability Resource Center. Thank you, Lillian, for answering that. All right. And then um, we can also answer any. I'm so glad we got a question. We were, were really hoping to get more questions. So keep thinking of questions. And then I think the next slide. Oh, are you done, Lillian? Okay. Um, this I, is Ferris. Ferris, can I just piggyback on something that Lily? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think, ahead. Be, I think it'd be really helpful for students to understand because I know that like people don't know all this stuff. So I was talking about when students register with the Disability Support Office. Once you get approved for your accommodations, then typically, and it sounds like at University of Arizona, this happens where a email goes out to all of your professors, and it doesn't tell the professor what your disability is, so it won't say. Joe Smith has a learning disability and needs these things. It'll just say Joe Smith gets extra time for tests, uh, a note taker, um, and whatever other accommodations are on there. And then it's up to you, the student, to actually have a conversation, hopefully, with the professor. That's what the disability support office people want to happen, that you have a conversation with the professor to say, Professor Smith, you know, Professor Smith, I'm just making up, Joe Smith and Professor Smith. Um, are having a conversation to say like, okay, you know, these are all the exams that are coming up in your class. I'm gonna need extra time for those. Should I take those exams with the disability support office or are you able to accommodate them in the classroom? And so students are expected to be able to have these conversations with their professors, which is a little bit different from high school usually. Cause usually in high school, your, your teachers all know you get extra time and they just make it happen. Hopefully that's how that works. <laughs> But, but in college, it's on the student, it's on you to be proactive. You have to look at your schedule, you have to plan out, when am I gonna take this exam with extra time? You have to get in touch with the disability support office. So that's a real change. And I just wanted to point that out before we jumped into the resources. I that's such wanna, an ex oh yeah, Eric wants to add, go I, ahead. I was just gonna add one, one uh, nuance to what Annie said. Um, as Annie pointed out, it is up to the student to self-advocate with each professor. And sometimes a student will decide selectively that they only need their accommodations in certain classes. Because you have to go to each professor individually, you might decide, you know, what I, the accommodations I need in my history course, uh, I may not need in my math course or vice versa. So uh, just because you have that letter with your accommodations doesn't mean you have to share it with every single professor. Um, that is up to the student to, to reach out to each professor. Um, also, uh, you know, I think this was, may have been clear from what Lillian said, but just to underline another point, the support programs like the SALT program and, and programs at other colleges that offer uh, learning support programs typically have a, their own application process. So just because you got into the university or just because you know you're going to be able to get accommodations because you have documentation of a disability doesn't mean you're automatically in that support program. Typically, there's a a separate application process. So you want to kind of find out what that is and when do you need to apply. Some programs have plenty of space, other ones fill up. Um, I see another great question in the chat. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, I, that's, a, that's a great question. And I'm going to share the resources to make sure we do and then we'll get back to that question. Um, but thank you for addressing that prior question. But just so you know, we're getting to you. Um, I want to share some resources that were also, I put inside the chat a PDF with all these live links, Accessible College, that's Annie's um, company. Um, the Autism Friendly College list comes from our, from one of your panelists here, uh, Eric. Um, and uh, it looks like um, some other great resources were added here. Um, I'm not going to go over all of them, 
So I'll, I'll just reference that these are, many of them were collected by our LD SIG, which is a, a disability focused special interest group of counselors. So really there's, there's a whole bunch of people conspiring to help your students, <laughs> just so you know. Okay, next slide. And then just more of these great resources um, and a couple that focus on COVID because COVID has impacted this process and campuses in, in many ways. And, and just, just a heads up, when you look at a list that might've been published a couple of years ago, very important to do your due diligence and double check, is that school still doing what they did two years ago? Uh, there could have been budget changes. Um, so, and, and truly, even when there's a change in the leadership of a disability support office or uh, a special support program, I, I don't think the SALT program or U of A is going anywhere. I think they're always gonna be one of these superstar programs. The reason they can charge for that SALT program is they're going above and beyond what is required by the law. The disability support office is doing what's required by law and they're going above that with that SALT program. Okay, and then next slide real quick. Um, I put all the names of the disability service offices for several four-year universities. And just to note how many different names they have. Sometimes in Hawaii, they have a Hawaiian name. And you have to know, of course, Kokua means help, right? So, um, and yet, the, you know, these are all great offices, but they all have different names. Um, Hawaii International Dyslexia Association publishes a free book uh, resources if you happen to have uh, dyslexia or other language-based challenges, Assistive Tech Resource Center of Hawaii. And I put NAMI on there because many of our students with either a learning disability or a health condition might have a coexisting um, mental illness or, or challenges with anxiety. So many of our students are challenged with anxiety or that might be their one, that might be their disability that we're talking about. So just something to consider that um, mental health is just always such an important thing to consider. And then next slide. Um, now we're gonna turn it over to the questions. I think we should start with this question of, and I'm gonna direct this to any of the panelists. I will start by saying, they can try to deny you, but they shouldn't. That would be against the law, but um, especially if it's already approved in the Disability Support Office. But I will say many of my students have experienced it. So um, can a professor deny you extra time? Extra time is very rarely denied, but um, or other required um, accommodations. Can they do that? Does anyone want to take a stab at that? Anyone in our panel? Annie, Eric, Lillian? I, I, I'll go for it. This is Annie. Okay. Um, All right. Uh, so. Yeah, the answer is no. If you've been approved for the accommodation through the Disability Support Office, so you've gone through the university's process to get approval for the accommodation, the professor can't deny the accommodation. What sometimes happens though, that being said, is that professors don't understand their obligation, right? So if you run into a problem where a professor says, oh, I, I don't believe in extra time or I don't give every, anyone extra time, which I've heard from professors in my role when I used to work in the disability support office, then you go back to the disability support office and you tell them, you say, professor so-and-so is refusing to give me extra time. And then hopefully they will work with you to, to figure it out and navigate that process. So that's another good reason why you wanna actually connect with the people in the disability support office prior to um, go, you know, enrolling in the school. That's a great question that you could ask. Have you ever had a professor who told a student they wouldn't be able to get extra time? What did you do in that circumstance? Ask the disability support people that, that question and see what their answer is and see how you feel about it. Because you wanna make sure that those people are gonna be supportive to you when you're in school there. And so it's, that's, that's, that's my, answer to that. <laughs> but well, Eric, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think you, you, you handle it quite well. I mean, I talk to a lot of disability staff in colleges and the word that I get is, you know, professors are there to work with students and they generally do a good job of accommodating. So don't be alarmed if you hear about the occasional, you know, nightmare situation on social media or something. Uh, could it happen that a student comes to a professor and the professor says, nope, not gonna do that. Absolutely, I have heard of that happening, but it's pretty rare. Um, so uh, it wouldn't be legal for a professor to say, no, I'm not gonna honor that accommodation, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't happen. And as Andy pointed out, you can go back to disabilities office and you and the disabilities office can advocate for you. Typically the disabilities office would step in and, and communicate with the professor and kind of set the record straight, but it doesn't happen very often. So I wouldn't, wouldn't worry too much about it. 
I would add also, um, if th this is all why to be proactive with your disability access needs, because if you um, get your accommodations in place prior to placement testing, very important if there is placement testing, prior to registration, those disability support counselors, they know the professors. If they know you, they're gonna be like, oh, don't take that class. And that's, <laughs> that's what you want. Like sometimes you have to major in ad drop, you know? Um, <laughs> So you figure out which professors work for you and um, th th those counselors really are good, but you got to work with them and be proactive. If you didn't request the accommodations in advance and you failed a midterm because you didn't get extended time, you cannot retroactively go back and say, oh, I should have had extended time. That's that's unfixable. So it is just a matter of that advocating in advance. Uh, Lillian, did you want to add anything to that one? No, I think you all um, said it all. Okay, cool. Um, there was another great question in the chat about um, IEPs and whether they are carried over to mainland colleges or local community colleges. Um, each college, I think, varies a little bit um, with regard to what documentation they will honor and require. IEPs, depending on what's in it, might reference a diagnosis. It's really good to have um, the external diagnosis information um, ideally as updated as possible um, within three years is kind of a good rule of thumb, but it really depends on your diagnosis. Um, and I just wanna say that um, that's why it's so important to check with those offices, but um, definitely keep all your documentation, all types of documentation and get it updated before college if possible from a private provider. I know that's expensive, but it's a lot cheaper than failing a semester. Um, anyone else wanna add to that, Eric? addressed it in the chat, but something about documentation, anything you want to add, especially with health conditions, because Annie's here and she's an expert on that. By, Any comments? By, or? by all means, just as I put in the chat, don't don't assume that the IEP is going to be the documentation by itself. Typically, it won't be. Uh, some colleges might be okay with that, but a lot of colleges will want documentation from a medical professional, um, not the not the, the high school education plan. And, uh, but the location where the college is located shouldn't have any impact, whether it's a mainland college or a community college shouldn't have any impact on whether the documentation holds. And I'll just, this is Annie, I'll just piggyback on that. Um, so I should, it, even though your IEP might not be accepted as your primary documentation, you can always give a copy of the IEP to the disability support office in addition to that full neuropsych evaluation or other documentation. And the reason that you would want to do that is because it's helpful sometimes for the disability support office people to see the types of accommodations that you had in high school. Um, it also establishes that you have a history of receiving accommodations. So things like your IEP, your 504 plan, those are kind of good um, supplemental documentation to have in addition to those doctor's letters. And also, if you take the ACT or the SAT and you received accommodations on those, if you have a copy of those letters as well, you can kind of start to build up your documentation folder, start a little file folder on your computer and just dump all those things in there. And then when the time comes, you'll have everything in one place. And that's helpful for the disability support office to see those things as well. Yeah, and uh, Annie mentioned the, the ACT or SAT. So um, getting accommodations on the standardized tests, for those, the IEP actually is helpful because that shows to the companies that, that administer the test that you have sort of a track record or a, a paper trail of having needed extended time on test. So absolutely, if you're thinking, oh, my child's gonna need extra time on the SAT, um, sometimes families are sort of on the fence. Do I need a 504 at school or not? If you don't have that, and then you go to the test company saying, hey, we need extra time because of uh, dyslexia or something, um, it's a much harder case to make if you don't already have that documented at school. So for that purpose, the IEP or 504 can actually be quite helpful. Excellent. Um, are there any other questions? We have um, about five minutes left. I, I hope to get a question from the audience, but if not, I have some stock questions I'm gonna ask my panelists. Type it into the chat if you have anything. Advocate, <laughs> this is your chance to practice. 
Okay, actually, my, my question I wanna ask um, our panelists to address if they can in five minutes. <laughs> okay, what gets in the way of student advocacy and accommodations access in terms of emotional, practical and cultural barriers? Just a small question. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, sorry. Um, I mean, hmm. it's so, so I think the power dynamic is really tricky sometimes for students because um, when you're going into college and you do have to be a really good self-advocate, it can be kind of uncomfortable to go up to your professor and have a conversation. And there is a power dynamic that you have to acknowledge there, right? Like, because it's a professor. And um, I always tell people that, tell all my students, like, professors are just people. They go home, they have problems, there's things going on in their house, they're just people. Um, so you have to be really kind of confident. Even though there is that power dynamic, sometimes it helps to write out a script, just like preparing for anything, any appointment that you have or anything like that. If you write out a script and kind of have that ready to go, that can be really helpful. Um, you know, emailing questions in advance can be really helpful to shift that dynamic too, so that the person on the receiving end kind of knows what's coming. Um, but it it's it's a trial and error process too. You have to like take sometimes take some risks and like dip a toe in the water before you decide that you're gonna go full steam and go swimming. Um, so. That's that's one of the things that I think students kind of struggle sometimes with that with that power dynamic. But there are some ways to sort of get things under control, like the list making, like the script making, um, to make yourselves more comfortable. The most common barrier I see is uh, students. So this is for students with learning differences that they've been in the special education system up through high school. And they have negative associations to that for various reasons. Maybe they don't like getting pulled out of class. They feel that it sets them apart. Maybe they've been teased or bullied. And so they associate all those negative experiences with be having that diagnosis and getting special services. So sometimes students have this idea or hope or attitude of, oh, uh, I don't think I'm going to need that in college. I don't want to do all that stuff in college. I think I'll be okay. Why don't I kind of see how it goes? And, you know, maybe if I need those accommodations or services, I'll, I'll look into that later on. So I think sometimes students want to kind of distance themselves from that disability identity. Uh, I don't see learning differences as a negative. I think for many, in many cases, there are tremendous strengths that come with them. So I encourage students to embrace who they are, um, be honest with themselves, understand what they're good at, what their challenges are, so that they can succeed in college. And having that sort of blanket, you know, oh, I'm just going to leave all that behind me, uh, does not tend to play out well in college, because it's a huge leap in executive function and self-advocacy, and that isn't the time to throw away all the supports. Um, over the course of college, as I think Lillian indicated with the SALT program, it's very common for students to reduce the amount of support that they're getting after freshman year or at some point. So that's totally fine. But to throw all of it away right as you're making that huge leap to college, I don't think makes a whole lot of sense. I think part of the reason that happens is because once they get into their major, they're often in their strength area. So it's those general ed requirements where they're having to kind of do a little bit of everything and that can be really hard. But once they're like, oh, this is my this is my groove, <laughs> they sometimes don't need as much accommodation. But that depends. The accommodations are not bad. Lillian, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just wanted to add there's a lot of great resources, too, and especially to help you transition moving to a new place and going into college. And um, there's a lot of resources that help you advocate for yourself. Um, you just have to really take that first initiative and kind of looking for those offices. And um, there's a lot of people um, on college campuses that do have your back and they are there for you. Just if you just need someone to talk to, maybe you're homesick, it could be anything. By the way, there was one other question in q and I don't know if folks saw it was about what, what um, is needed on the documentation. Um, question was, in the sufficient document, what information should be included? Um, so I just respond to that saying that it's primarily the um, diagnosis and, and recommended accommodations at the at a minimum. 
And um, I think uh, Ferris added to that um, updated cognitive test, academic update, confirmation of diagnosis needs, accommodations. Rationale is important. Yeah. So that's just the minimum. A good evaluation tends to go into much more detail. Sometimes they're upwards of 20 pages. Um, but it should absolutely have the diagnosis and the accommodations. It can't just be a letter from a primary doctor saying this student needs extra time on tests without any rationale or diagnosis be behind it. Can I, can I just add one thing? So if you go to the Disability Support Office's website, usually they'll have a, a space where you can see what the documentation requirements are, and they'll even have documentation guidelines there. So you'll be able to see if it's, you know, if they want a neuropsych that was done three to five years, what the specifics are. And then for health conditions and physical disabilities as well, or for hearing impairments or vision impairments too, they'll have specific um, criteria, of what they want the doctor to outline in those in those documentation guidelines. So you should be able to find those at, on, the, on their website, but if not, you can always give them a call or email them and, and get that information. A shout out to one of our participants who said, I also strongly suggest students make use of professor's office hours for one-on-ones. This can be very helpful. Absolutely. One-on-one -on -one time with professors, not only for students with disabilities, but establishing those mentoring relationships will make the difference about whether college is a life-changing ex experience or not. I am so thankful for this panel that came together um, because it just is one of my life goals to get this information out to a wider audience. So thank you so much, Annie and Eric and Lillian for joining us here in our Hawaii time zone. <laughs> um, and I really, really appreciate it. Looks like Russ is gonna close us out. I am, and I wanna thank you all once again for uh, participating and thank everyone for attending. And when you close this window, there'll be a link to a very quick four question survey. We'd appreciate any feedback you can provide. This is just one of many sessions being hosted. Be sure to sign up for additional ones where you signed up for this one if you haven't already. And in about a week, you'll be able to find this session's recording as well as all of the other session recordings at strivescan.com slash Hawaii. Once again, thank you to our four presenters for this session. Thank you very much. And thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.